Hello, I'm Barbara Gon Mueller, and I welcome you. You know, we've been doing these podcasts. In fact, our guest today is number 112. Why? Because when I did a conference with Jean Houston, I realized that we have to have mentors who will teach us from their wisdom and their experiences and their books as I am reading Climate Restoration by our guest today. And as you listen to our peacepodcast.org guests, you too will be motivated to make the difference wherever you are. Even if it's home and you're having dinner, maybe you will be the reason your children decide to do something. Let me give you a little background about Peter Fikowski. Peter Fikowski was introduced to me by Frank Sanitati. And I say that with such great respect because Frank Sanitati and I have been lifelong friends and he lives in Santa Barbara as I do. And so today we're going to talk to Peter Fikowski, the author of Climate Restoration, The Only Future That Will Sustain the Human Race. This book came out in 2022. He's an MIT educated physicist, Silicon Valley entrepreneur, philanthropist, and he has 27 patents, 30 years of experience as a citizen lobbyist for poverty and climate issues, and over the past decade has been working to build the organizations required to ensure the survival and flourishing of humanity. His mission is to leave a world we're proud of to our children. To that end, he founded the Foundation of, for Climate Restoration, Methane Action, Stable Planet Alliance, and the Climate Restoration Safety and Governance Board. Now, with all of those wonderful attributes to our guest, Peter Fikowski, I wonder, what kind of world are we going to leave to our children, Peter? Oh, that's an interesting question, Barbara. There's, there, it depends on how you ask it. You ask, how, what are we going to leave? And then uh, when you ask it that way, it evokes the science brain. Now, if you ask what world we want to leave for our children, now, now think about that. What but, kind of world do we want to leave for our children? That's yeah. the question. Right. Isn't it interesting to, to notice the difference? I'm just, as I'm, I'm talking, our listeners are thinking, like, what's the difference between what we are going to leave predictably and what we want to leave? And, um, you know, because I, I thought about this a lot back in the late 90s and early 2000s. I worked uh, with your, our friend Frank Sanitate uh, with results. We made phenomenal progress on vaccinating the world's kids, reducing the child mortality rate, the maternal mortality rate, increasing the global literacy rate. Phenomenal progress on all these things. And one of the chief measures of it was, oh, we're saving lives. Now, I, I, I'm a physicist from MIT, and I actually learned that to our knowledge, no one lives forever. And so saving a life is, is actually only extending a life, right? And as soon as you say extending a life, you say, okay, are we making it worth living, that life that we're extending? And th that, what that and that's the same question you asked. What world are we going to live? Are we planning to leave for our children? And is it what it's another way of saying, what's a life worth extending for them? And so um sort of begin. I have to ask this. Where does it begin? Does it begin with the vision that we see the world we want to have for our children by the efforts that we're making today? Yeah. Yeah. So, so nor, I, before the show, you and I were talking and I said, it's sort of like going to Starbucks. You know, if I have a meeting at Starbucks, um, what I, you know, you know, I set the meeting and at a certain point I visualize walking up to Starbucks three minutes early. Right. And yes. then everything happens, right. The universe aligns and I get there, you know, whenever I get there, which is usually two minutes early, which is just great. But my point is it starts with that vision. And then, you know, uh, the universe, our brain, our, our hive brain, all, all of that combines to get us there. And if I think about turning the key in my car, turning right down the street, I'll never make it to Starbucks. God knows where I'll end up. So, it, yes, it, it starts with envisioning the, where you want to go. And the thing that I we've seen in the last couple of years is where we want to go is a 
very closely related to, to who we're being. Or saying it the other way, who we're being is a function of where we want to go. So um, you know, you're sitting here with a logo above you that says peace is possible. And that's where you're going. Mm -hmm. and it aligns your neurons most of the day. I just know that you know, this is our, my first time meeting you, but we know being human, your neurons are aligned towards peace as possible. And everything you do is consistent with that, except the ones that aren't and those get corrected. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, and so uh, who we're being is a function of the future. And so the, the, as a scientist, I ask- we are, I have to stop you. Who we are being is a function of the future. That's a very powerful statement. Who we are being right now. Keep going, because boy, did that hit me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you both of you and you and I have done Landmark, I think. And uh, in in uh, one of the things they talk about in Landmark courses is, is just this example of on Friday night, you've got all these emails and deadlines and so on. And this guy is happy. Why? Because he's got a ticket to Hawaii the next day. He's off to Hawaii, so this you know he's excited. And because and at that future gives him being excited and and so on and uh, and similarly you know it's really the future that gives us our being and the the question I asked is um, you know but when I've traveled in developing countries with a little bit not a lot but it's always been very clear that the thing that lights me up are the kids playing. And uh, the, the joy on their faces. And the thing that distresses me are the people just despondent, just like glum, like there's no future for them. And I could see that all of the work that I do, and I think all of my colleagues, you know, again, like Frank, who've been working on poverty and hunger over the decades, it really is about bringing that joy of life to people. And then the question is like, well, what gives that? Is it drugs? Probably not. I mean, drugs certainly have a benefit for, for some length of time. But I looked at who, who we are evolved as. And you know, we're a social species. Um, our success is dependent on the fact that we communicate, we love each other, we work together. And um, uh, in order to be successful, you know, uh, I, I like looking at evolution, but not like the, the, the with that book, last century about the selfish gene. And it's not about the, the selfish gene isn't, it, it misinterprets, it, it lives in the, the modern thinking of the 20th century and the 19th century that we are our thoughts, that we're individuals. Now, that, that's clearly false. <laughs> you know, other than uh, if you read certain things, but if you just look at the world, we are, you know, if, if I look at the, a bee in a beehive. A bee is very interesting, but all the action is in the beehive. And you know, if I imagine a bee having thoughts, it doesn't matter if they do or not, but if I imagine a bee having thoughts, it's the bee is thinking, what does my beehive need? And his, the bee's actions are designed to, to take care of the beehive. If there's something the bee needs to sting and give its life, that's the thing it does. Um, you know, and, and humans are very much the same. We're actually the hive. It's actually humanity that we're evolved to take care of. And um, so then the question is, what do we what do we need to set up in terms of structures that leaves that joy on people's faces? Because that joy is how our DNA tells us, do what you're doing, right? And so, you know, you're being a mentor lights you up. I don't, yeah, you know, you, you'll yeah. see when you look at this, you'll see yourself totally lit up. It lights people up. You know, contributing, singing in the choir, putting on a play, cooking a meal, all of these things, contributing lights people up because we're just, you know, the DNA figured out over however many millions of years, that's how you have a flourishing species is it contributes and it explores because you know, any tribe which didn't explore at some certain point, there was a wildfire or a flood, and that tribe got got washed out. If they explored over the over the ridge, you know the you know that that one group may have gotten washed out, but their cousins across the ridge survived. And so we're designed to be explorers. 
and just those two principles that contributing to the to the community and exploring are the two things I see that we want to put in for our children. So that, that's the answer to your question is what's the world we want to give our, to our children? It's a world where people can contribute and a people where people where people can explore and that gives people joy. And the truth is people will people get born, they learn, they have kids, they get older, they start having grandkids. You know, and after a while, yeah, as you and I know, a lot of our friends start passing away because that's what happens <laughs> on the downside of the art. It's natural. It's healthy, right? You can look at us. We're, we're not young sprites anymore and we're lit up because we're fine with that uh, living on that arc of life because it's about the community, not about this one. I just love what you're saying. And your book is so positive. That's the part that really got me. Your climate restoration, it's a different story. It's a different story than zero carbon or carbon neutrality. It's a story about what we can do today and what we can do to save our world and save our climate. So where do we begin? Well, we begin, um, first of all, noticing that the, the, the you know, people, at, well, the, well, beginning at the end is always a good thing to do. <laughs> and, and so at the end of the conversation is, oh my God, why aren't we doing this yet? And the answer is, that um, you know, we're, we're run by the media for not surprisingly. And the media uh, wants, is, our attention is automatically drawn to blood, to disasters, to problems. And so we talk about the climate universally as like, oh, a climate disaster. And uh, that puts our attention on the disaster. Mm -hmm. And uh, our job, yours and my job, is to put the focus on the, the climate restored. Because we actually know how to do it. Turn, you know, well, hopefully we'll have a few minutes. I'll tell you how we do it. But nature does it, right? Uh, we have ice ages every X years, and um, nature has to cool, cool the planet down the same amount that we're gonna that we're heated up. So uh, that thousand gigatons of CO two, nature pulls it out over and over again. We just have to do what nature does. And we've worked out the numbers. It, it'll cost about a hundred million dollars a year, uh, yeah, maybe a billion, but that's nothing. Like it, it, it's the you know less than the budget of San Antonio, Texas, for the whole freaking planet. The reason we're not doing it is our attention has been drawn to what's the problem? What's the problem? So the the, the main thing is to focus that. Oh, we want to restore the climate. The the. Yeah, I, I work with the UN and I've worked with Vatican and I've worked with in Congress. Um, I had a conversation yesterday with one of the, the climate people at the White House. And the problem is that 32 years ago, the UN said, OK, our climate goal is to stabilize the climate. Now, today, stabilizing the climate is crazy talk because we're having wildfires and floods and people are dying of heat because it's you know 50 Celsius or 130 Fahrenheit and you can't survive that. And like we don't want to we don't want to stabilize. We want to bring it back to yeah. industrial. So yeah. our job is to change is to talk about restoring the climate so that the UN says, well of course we're going to restore the climate. What else would we do? Uh-huh. And you say in your book restore CO2 levels to humans have survived. Uh, below 300 ppm by 2050. Then you go on to say, restore methane to lower levels and create capacity to oxidize a potentially horrific methane burst. These are real practical solutions, but the one that got me was the ocean. When you talked about putting iron, is that realistic? Do you have iron? Um, is it iron ore? How do you do this? Talk about the ocean. Yeah, well, visualize how how nature does it, and and you get the picture. So, um, in well, order, I've for, heard about nature doing it after a volcano erupts, but I'm not sure if that's the same interesting <laughs> idea. <laughs> right, right. Maybe we don't want to, to cause a volcano. That has been discuss discussed. Discussed. <laughs> um, uh, before the ice ages, um, what you, happens is you get uh. Uh, dust storms blowing off the Sahara, blowing off the Kalahari uh, deserts, and they blow dust and other from other places. That dust has iron in it. Iron. Yeah, and and so now you just think of you know a uh, very fine iron ore, 
but just in the form of dust. So, so it's iron dust. And uh, you know, technically it's primarily iron sulfate, but iron oxide works as well. And, but who cares about the technical side? Uh, but it's just iron, very, very, very fine iron dust, so fine that it doesn't really sink. And, um, and that's how nature does it. And that's what we would do is uh, rather than, we want to do it very carefully because nature does, does it haphazardly. Um, and, uh, but we know we, there are certain places in the ocean you can put the iron where uh, it will uh, be very effective sequestering carbon. Uh, what the iron allows the algae to grow. Algae is the plants of the ocean, uh, the base of the food pyramid in the ocean. And um, the iron allows it to grow. The, if you think about you know, vacations on the ocean, usually you go where, there, where the beaches are blue. And blue means there's no, it's not green. There's nothing growing. And in most cases, it's because uh, uh, th there's not enough iron because the iron tends to sink. Iron doesn't dissolve well in, in water. And so it's the, the missing micronutrient. And so putting it in, as I said, uh, overall, just $100 million a year will we'll do it. But uh -huh. we have to decide first. Uh -huh. And so it's an iron rich dust that you're talking about that exactly. allows this increase of healthy phytoplankton in the oceans. And I read your chapter. That chapter was fantastic. As I said, I picked up your book this morning because I'm an early riser and it was dropped in my mailbox yesterday and I got it off of Amazon. Again, everyone, this is Climate Restoration, the only future that will sustain the human race by Peter Fikowski. There okay. you go. That's it. And when you read this chapter on iron rich dust storms and, and the results for the salmon, the results for the gigantic fish that people were catching because they were fed well. And then you go to the next issue, carbon dioxide. How do you capture billions of tons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere? You know, and I was telling Peter, he should get an award for his book. I got several awards for my book, Revolutionary Conversations. Why? It was written in ordinary language. There's no words that you can't understand. And the solutions for our climate restoration are spelled out so beautifully that you want to take notes and then you want to go home and tell everybody what you learned today because it was really beautifully written. So you gave me a little plug for Carol Douglas, who was your co-author. And it sounds like she knows how to put words in a way that make us motivated to do something. That's what I got out of your book. I was mm -hmm. motivated not only to read your book twice, which I've only on the first reading, but to use how you give us ideas like you seaweed to capture carbon. Think about that. It's so simple. I live right by the ocean. I'm going to go out and thank the seaweed now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, the, the it's a thinking kind of a problem that uh, when I spoke to the scientist at the White House yesterday, he was he was sort of blocked because he said, you know, Peter, there aren't any peer reviewed science articles discussing how do we get these massive amounts of carbon out of the atmosphere. And because it's not in the scientific literature yet, uh, because no one's paid to have it studied because it wasn't a goal. Uh, as a scientist, he can't recommend it to the White House. And so it's our job to promote the idea that we want to restore the climate. Because when we say it, the scientists will say, oh, I guess people do want to restore the climate. Let's research it. Uh, but it, that, that's the, the, the real action for us is to share about it. You know, and, and doing things like putting solar panels on your house. It was one of the things that got me going was uh, when my daughter was in high school 15 years ago. Uh, she said, Dad, what do you think about putting solar panels on the house? I said, well, Erica, you know, I don't, you know, I've done the numbers and it's not really that good an investment. And then I slept on it and I said, you know what, let's just do it and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Well, here's what happened is I wasn't at 15 years ago, I was never thinking about the climate. I figured, you know, uh, if you read the book, you'll see my, my story that when I was a, a teenager at MIT, I read about the climate. I said, oh, we've got to get a thousand gigatons of carbon out of the atmosphere. Ah, we do that in submarines. We know how to do it. It's an engineering problem, but I'm a physicist. 
for a physicist, engineering is really complicated. Just as a for an engineer, I'm sure that the kind of physics I do is complicated. But um, I said, thank God the engineers will do it. And so I swore it off. I said, I'm not going to get in their way. I just want to empower them by you know doing the physics I do. And so 35 years later, I discovered that they weren't working on it. And that was where I just realized that it was because we had been messaging climate as a problem and our attention was on the disaster and so that's again where climate restoration came from it's like focus on the result the climate restored and then you just the brain naturally just takes you there and that's what i loved about your book the hopefulness that we together can restore our climate it's like um we all need to get on the climate restoration train and, and if we all work together and we don't have these silos of people in wars and anger and not getting along, that's why I wrote the book, Revolutionary Conversations. How do you have a conversation when somebody is in the total opposite of your alignment and your agreements and all the other things you live for? Well, you have to have a conversation. And the first start, the first thing you do is you stop. Zeph Pose, you told me something I wasn't clear about. I'd say, may I stop you for a moment? and ask you a question so that you begin to understand where you're coming from, Peter, so that people understand where you're coming from, not just from where I'm coming from. And it allows you to have that conversation. And I truly believe that climate is a conversation. I think if we start the conversations and we talk about our vision for our grandchildren, and we talk yeah. about carbon restoration, and we talk about capturing billions of carbon dioxide and making things out of it. This is such a great book. I tell you, I cannot stop complimenting you. So oh, at this point, what do you think is our first thing we should be doing besides having conversations and buying your book? Oh, you know, just talk about our grandkids. And if you don't have grandkids yet, or you're not going to talk about our collective grandkids and the world we're going to give them because that vision is uh, is what's going to give the action. As I said, uh, in my 20 minutes with the guy at the White House yesterday on on, on the phone, I, I failed to really transmit the whole vision. Now, the seed is planted. That's the key for you. You know that in public relations, they say be very clear in kindergarten language, what is you want to communicate? Very, your book does it. For instance, I'm reading the very last page of your book. The climate restoration lens focuses on the outcome we all want. We can work together to get there, especially now a growing, that a now growing committed group is cleared on the goal. And I hope you'll decide to join the group. Right away, you give us an invitation to join the climate restoration group. And it's like they said, you know, how do you, you have to fall back in love with nature, fall back in love with making the world work for all and fall back in love with having sunshine and rain and all the things that climate brings us. And instead of looking at it as a disaster, look at it with joy, as you said. Yes. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. I, I often describe the process we're in as a bar mitzvah for humanity. That it's a coming of age because when, you know, when, when I was a kid, I just played. I did whatever I felt like and my parents would call me in. You know, I burned a hole in the floor once and my parents fixed it and my <laughs> friend burned down his garage and they had to do whatever they the mother would always take care of it. The parents would take care of it. At this point, Mother Nature is, you know, and we as a world society, we've always assumed that Mother Nature will take care of things. Right. You know, if you build a forest, you move away. And in 15 years, the forest has come back and people can, you know, and, and it, it, Mother Nature takes care of it. At a certain point, uh, I think she uses the pottery barn rule, which is you break it, you own it. Mm -hmm. And so it's now time for us to, rather than being kids and assume it'll turn out well, we actually have to design the future as humanity for the first time in the history of our planet. And have that design as a vision for our planet. Yes. And, you know and that's where peace is possible, because it's natural for any any tribe to have fights. If they don't fight, they're not going to, you know, it's just not going to work. But uh peace is possible now when we're one tribe we have to reinvent we're one tribe 
And you know, but that one takes one whole family. I always feel like this is a family unit. And the astronauts tell us it's just this little blue ball. And this yeah. little blue ball with all those people on there, we need to be fall back, fall back in love with our planet, fall back in love with nature. And your the only future that will sustain the human race is a very readable book. And I advise all of you to get Climate Restoration by Peter Fikowski because it allows you to have the vocabulary to have that conversation. And Frank Sanitati wrote a one or two page overview. And if you would like to have a copy of that, just email me and I'll send you a copy of Frank's review. But also, Peter, at the end of our conversations, we always talk about what is your website? Where can we go to find out more about you and um, bring our own efforts to you to help you and help the world understand that climate restoration is a vision and a possibility. Yes, uh, it's peterfikowski.com, F-I-E-K-O-W-S-K-Y.com. Uh, one of the great things you can do right now is go on it and uh, the, one of the tabs is endorse the, the resolution. So uh, last month, California passed a resolution saying that California is committed to restoring the climate for future generations. It's the first time any, uh, any state or, or nation uh, has made that declaration. And that will change the way we think. And so the next step is to build on that, to have it introduced into Congress. And so we're getting people and especially organizations endorsing it. So our members of Congress don't have to feel like they're sticking their neck out that uh -huh. they're endorsed by the Sierra Club. So I invite you know that then they'll feel safe to bring it into the House and the Senate and then the administration and my friend at the White House I spoke to yesterday, once they know that uh, organizations want to restore the climate, they want to make sure our grandchildren survive, then it'll be a no brainer. So you can go to my website and sign up. What go to the website and it, it, you'll find it also very easy to navigate. And again, the climate restoration is the, because we can make the difference. We can do what is needed. And I think about that. And I think about the vision that I have. Why do I work on ending war? Why do I work on climate restoration? Why do I carry on my late husband, Robert Mueller's idea, 7,500 of them? Because he felt his, his education at the United Nations was what we need today. Why did he create the World Corps curriculum and the, all the different programs? And so with that, I want you to remember that you are important and why we do peacepodcast.org because we found out that mentors, and we have one right here, Peter Fikowski, who is really going to show you that you really can make a difference and the future will be because we sustain the human race. And with that, Peter, do you have a last word? Oh, does everybody thank you for taking the time to listen? That is an indication of your commitment. And uh, yeah, sign up and endorse the resolution because that you're creating that, expanding that conversation into the, uh, uh, into the US government and then to the United, United Nations. Absolutely. The United Nations is celebrating a celebration of the human rights. Our human rights is now 75 years old. And I remember I was too young to remember Eleanor Roosevelt, but my late husband did. And he said she was so passionate about human rights. You need to be passionate about climate restoration. Use your energy. You know, people sometimes get down in the dumps because the news sells more products when they're down in the dumps. But I have to tell you something. <laughs> enthusiasm that other people need and watch how their faces light up be that smile that another person needs because you're the reason we're alive today and with that peter you have done such an incredible job in this book and um i look forward to more conversations with you i think this is just the very beginning and with that i say thank you thank, thank you very much very much and thank you listeners as peter said we couldn't do it without you we need you as much as you need us. And this is number 112. Watch this with some friends or your family and have a conversation. I'm Barbara Gon Mueller. Thank you for joining us. And we'll see you again on number 113. Thank you.